When studying prehistoric life, obviously much of the evidence comes from fossils, raising the question, what are uh, fossils? Well, most animals, most organisms, uh, when they die, will not fossilize. Um, now that's good uh, for a bunch of reasons. One is, obviously, I like this stuff, this stuff here, I'm rather fond of, but I didn't invent this stuff. This stuff, which is carbon molecules, the sugars, the lipids, the proteins, it had previous owners before me. And when I was very little, I started ingesting biomolecules from others. Like I ate meals and I got bigger, but this stuff came from other living things. So when living things die, if they don't take their stuff with them, that's good because then that stuff can get recycled and then other living things get to use it after them. So that's good for that reason. Also, it's probably good that when you approach your house, um, you don't pass along paths and roads, you know, everything that has died there, you know, that these things decompose. That's, that's also very uh, good. But obviously, <clears throat> we would like, you know, to study uh, the life of the past. So if living things are somehow preserved, at least occasionally, you know, obviously that's what we need. So fossils do form, but they form in a number of ways. So first off, there is like the best case. So in, let's say an insect dies, that it is encased in tree sap, maybe it died near a broken limb, etc. And then with pressure and time, this uh, tree sap then becomes rock called amber. The insect would then be preserved inside. Now, this would be what's called an example of an unaltered remain uh, in that the um, insect's cells are still there with the DNA. DNA could then be extracted. And so uh, obviously in the, the movie Jurassic Park, that was uh, the premise that um, <clears throat> a DNA uh, you know, is preserved afterwards. So here's an ant preserved in amber. That's a real ant. You know, it could be a hundred million years old, but it's still an ant. And so therefore there would be cells, there would be DNA, you could do a DNA fingerprint of this ant, just like you could an ant alive uh, today. So that is a wonderful example of uh, unaltered uh, uh, remains. Um, there are uh, other possible examples. So mammoths uh, frozen in ice from the last ice age would also be frozen meat a frozen mammoth, which would have cells and DNA, um, uh, etc. Tar can sometimes preserve animals as well. So for example, uh, the Spanish word for tar is brea, so la brea tar pits uh, in Southern California and brea in uh, Mexico can preserve animals. So sometimes you get the whole organism, its cells, its DNA, everything. But those unaltered remains that's the exception. Another type of fossilization is what's known as perimineralization. As here you can see in petrified wood, if you were to go uh, outside the Smithsonian, um, you could see uh, petrified uh, tree trunks uh, there, obviously then raising the question. This certainly looks like wood, right? But it is as hard as rock. It looks like wood, you can count tree rings, um, et cetera. Um, but uh, how would this form? Well, uh, in this example, this is bone, but the same would apply to wood. Um, living things can have holes in them, even if they're very little holes. So bone has holes in it. Wood has holes in it. I mean, what wood is, is dead plant cells, which compose what's called xylem. They're hollow with the idea that water can go through these hollow tubes. So the individual cells are now hollow. Um, bone then also has spaces. And so whether it be, um, you know, the formation of petrified wood or petrified bone, it would happen in this way. That after death, something would be buried, and then water would work its way through this dead material. Now, water can have minerals in it. I mean, you might know that from, let's say, your bathtub or your sink, that dripping water can then leave um, in its wake this buildup of minerals that then you have to clean uh, off. So there's minerals in the water, and these minerals can then precipitate out and form solids. Well, if that happens here, 
that water works its way through the spaces in this bone that has holes in it, or the holes in the hollow cells of wood, then the minerals can build up and with pressure and time become solid rock. So you have bone, this is real bone with the real structure, um, but now there's rock that fills in the spaces that existed in the bone originally. Or you have real wood, you can count the tree rings, you can study the, the structure of the cell walls of the plant um, cells, um, but <clears throat> uh, it is rock that is now in between the, uh, in the spaces that once were. Uh, that's a type of fossilization known as perimineralization. There's another one I simply mentioned if you became a geologist. Um, uh, there are different forms of certain minerals. So for example, calcium carbonate can form both calcite and aragonite. And sometimes the process of fossilization changes one into another. That's what's re called recrystallization. Um, and so a geologist studying fossils, that might be one of interest as well. A fourth one more generally of interest is what's called replacement. So this looks like a living thing. It looks like a snail shell or the shell that like some um, extinct uh, squid relatives would have, but it's not, it's, it's rock. There's no living stuff there. There are no cells, there are no you know, uh, proteins from living things. This looks like snail shells, but it's not, all right? This is rock. It's not you know, the calcium carbonate stuff of snail shells. So how is it that rock looks like a living thing, all right? How does you know, uh, this form like a living thing? This looks like a shell, a brachiopod shell. But look, it's made of fool's gold. How did that happen? How do you get you know, a rock, a mineral, um, in, in place of uh, what was once a living tissue? Well, most dead organisms will decompose completely, as you'll see uh, with uh, the one on the left. And there are then no you know, living, you know, no sign that that organism ever exists. All of its biomolecules are gone. But if an animal is buried, its biomolecules can very gradually be replaced by those minerals in water that I mentioned previously. So water starts to work its way through its, um, this uh, material. It dissolves a little of the living stuff, but some of the minerals get left behind. It dissolves a little bit more of the living or the formerly living stuff, um, but the minerals get left behind. And so because this happens gradually, what can result is that minerals are then laid down um, in place of the proteins, lipids, you know, et cetera, which made up the shape of the organism. So then if this hardens and becomes rock, you now have rock, which looks like a living thing but it doesn't have any of the original molecules from the living thing. There are no proteins, there's no chitin or cellulose. Um, instead, it's rock made of minerals, but these minerals had gradually replaced the uh, living tissue. So this is known as uh, replacement. So for example, in this fossil here, they look like seashells, but there's no seashell stuff. Like no protein, no calcium carbonate. Um, so instead, this is just a mineral because the minerals have gradually replaced the original stuff of the, uh, the once uh, living uh, thing. Um, and so there are a couple of variations on uh, this uh, uh, theme. Um, and so once again, uh, this replaces you know, the stuff that was originally there. Um, some, for example, that would be a replacement fossil of the outside of a clamshell, but you could also then have a replacement of the inside of the clam uh, shell. So that, um, you know, sediment filled inside the clamshell, the ultimately the shell dissolves, um, but now here's an internal mold of what was originally there. Now, because minerals, there's different kinds of minerals and they can have different hues, the minerals which filled in the space can have a different color or hue from the background uh, miner minerals of the uh, substrate. And so thus that would make them more uh, and more visible. Here, you, you know, obviously this squid relative didn't have crystals uh, inside of it, you know, but so here, you know, crystals which have, um, uh, which have uh, form. 
Um, so replacement is a type of fossilization. Finally, um, uh, there is a type of fossilization known as carbonization. Um, living things are made of carbon molecules. So sugars are carbon. So notice that in this glucose molecules, there are black carbon atoms here. Um, but proteins, lipids, DNA, RNA, all of these are carbon-based molecules. So notice here in this uh, fatty acid, uh, the carbon is here in black. So let's imagine that, say, a shark dies. Um, so it's got proteins, sugars, fats, et cetera, all made of carbon, all with this black carbon in it. You know, we know that pure carbon is black. I mean, we see coal, I'll be getting back to coal. Um, but then also, like, if you were grilling something and you left it uh, too long on the grill, you know, whatever the charred rest of, you know, whatever is you were grilling um, would then be black because that would just be carbon because the, the water, the, the oxygen and the hydrogen had, um, had been evaporated out in the, the smoke. Uh, so here, if this shark is essentially squished and most of its material, you know, ends up dissolving, being washed away, but if there is just a residue um, containing some of that carbon, then the residue would be black and could form, say, an outline of the animal. So you don't really have the animal per se, but you have carbon from the animal, which then... Um, uh, forms this uh, black uh, outline of uh, where it once was. And so you could say, oh, you know, this, this animal had these types of fins. I can see that in, uh, you know, the carbonized uh, outline uh, of it. All right. Now, um, let's imagine that instead of uh, a carbonized fossil of one single animal like, you know, that shark, Let's imagine that we go back to, say, the Carboniferous period, a time period actually named after the carbon which was uh, preserved uh, from that time period. And we go to a swamp near the coast, and the you know, eastern United States was closer to the equator at this time. So you had these vast um, uh, uh, swamps, and there was an inland sea. So uh, here's a, a swamp near water. Well, as trees die, as needles fall, as all of this organic material forms muck, it has a lot of carbon in it. It's from the wood, the leaves, et cetera. So we have this muck. Well, if the muck gets buried uh, and it's anoxic, there's no oxygen, so it doesn't decompose uh, well. So you have all of this carbon. If it doesn't get broken down, then over time it could get smushed and smushed with you know, pressure and uh, high temperatures. And then over time, this could then become coal. So just as you could have the carbonized uh, remains of one specific animal, you could then have just lots and lots of prehistoric uh, carbon that just gets uh, combined. So here are fossils where you can see outlines of, um, of organisms. That's the carbon that they once had. Uh, so that would be a type of fossilization known as carbonization. All right, so once again, if you squish living things, or you can have this residue of the carbon they once had. And you can say, oh, okay, so here's where a root once was, or this reptile once had, you know, a fin, or, you know, here's a carbonized remains of a leaf. So you, you get, this was a leaf once, but all you're really seeing is just the carbon of it. And if you ask, well, well what then is coal? Imagine that you have a lot of carbon, like swamp muck, and you just squish it, and then you get a black residue from the first layer, followed by another black residue, by the second layer, another black residue, another layer, et cetera, then you have all of this carbon, um, which uh, then uh, can be compressed to form coal. So coal is the remains of, say, forest growing in you know, terrestrial environments, while petroleum is then the remains of lots and lots of carbon from marine life. So this could be all sorts of marine life, but certainly there could be lots of microorganisms like you know, algae and diatoms and the like. This could then produce this carbon-rich ooze, which then gets um, uh, converted under pressure and a higher temperature to petroleum. If there's an even higher temperature, then it can be converted to natural gas. And so uh, this is another form of carbonization. It's not really part of the lecture right now, but obviously the fact that all of this carbon has been buried for hundreds of millions of years, but we extract the coal, the petroleum, the natural gas, and then we burn it. It then goes into the atmosphere once again, 
and the rising levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are contributing to climate change, which is a significant thing we have to consider at the end of you know, our discussions of the history of life uh, on uh, Earth. Okay. Uh, so there are different ways that fossils can uh, be formed. Now, just a couple quick thoughts on um, fossils uh, before uh, <laughs> uh, leaving the topic. Um, first off, uh, if you find a fossil, I know there's the temptation, ah, let's name it a new species. You know, here we have species number one, here's species number two, um, you know, et cetera. Um, but here's then the question, uh, how do we define a species? All right, and so in biology in general, you know, a, a rough de definition is that these are the populations which can reproduce with each other under natural conditions. But that's hard to apply even among living things. But now look at these dead things. I mean, could they have sex and have offspring? How would we know? All right, and, and so here's the thing. If this one, notice its horn goes up a little bit, all right, is that a new species? Or is that, um, you know, is this just a variable species? Well, how much do species vary? Well, it turns out some species don't vary much at all, all right? And so some things that we recognize as different species, so let's take lions and tigers, their skeletons are about the same, all right? And then so, you know, if you had the bones of a lion or a tiger, it'd be hard to distinguish, you know, which uh, it was. So um, these are rather, you know, relatively conservative skeletons, whereas then if you look at a dog, Dogs vary enormously, like small dogs versus big dogs. There's huge differences there. So lions and tigers, we consider different species, even though their skeletons are about the same, while dogs we recognize as one single species, even though their skeletons are very different. So how do we apply this here? Well, you, get, you guess, you make an educated guess. The experts who study this, they publish the results. I think this is one species or different species for this reason. And since this is science, we don't always have to agree. You could say, you know what, I'm not a lumper who tends to like lump different fossils in to one, you know, big variable species. I tend to be more of a splitter who recognizes different species here. And that's fine. So when we, you know, later in the course, when we talk about uh, hominids and you see, you know, like um, Homo habilis, well, are all of these skulls Homo habilis, one species? Or should we split Homo habilis up into a couple of different species? So it's hard enough to recognize you know, a species and for everyone to agree on a species today when you can actually see who, you know, which organisms can mate with which and which ones can have fertile offspring, et cetera. If all you have are the bones, it gets tough. So um, just keep that in mind that sometimes uh, uh, there are these variable species. So even though you found two skulls which look a little different, doesn't necessarily mean you found two different species. Sometimes there's a gender difference, all right? And so with Parasaurolophus, uh, there seem to be two shapes of the crest. Now, someone might say, oh, I found a new skull whose crest has a different shape than the last one discovered. I found a new species, great. But another interpretation might be, well, because we're finding these in about equal proportions in like the same area, instead of a different species, it just might be males and females of one species. So be careful because sometimes males look different from females. And so instead of classifying them as two different species, perhaps then it's just one single species and you're looking at a gender difference. Now, if you didn't know frogs, you know, I think most of us would say that this is one animal and here's a completely unrelated animal. Um, but the, because we know frogs, we can say, oh, that's the larval form, and then it grows up into this. Caterpillars are the larval forms of butterflies, even though they look very different. Um, well, we know that about these modern organisms, um, but what about fossil organisms? Many of them have larval forms as well. So you might see, you know what, I named this species, I named this species. Oh, wait, come to think of it, maybe they're not two different species. Maybe this one is the... Um, the larva of that one. So once again, you just have to be careful. You just can't name everything a new species. Sometimes the process of fossilization will distort a specimen so that like as something, you know, remains are put under a great deal of pressure, sometimes it, you know, will slightly deform it. And so now this fossil sample might look different from another one, even though it's the same species. It wasn't that they look different in life. It's that the process of fossilization 
uh, distorted it. Uh, so here we see proconsul, um, an ancestral ape, but the original you know, skull was distorted a bit. Um, the, uh, it looks a little different from the animal, how it appeared in life, because fossilization uh, distorted it, as would be, um, you know, say, uh, say Halanthropus, the hominid uh, here. Um, so the previous video just mentioned that you have to be careful. You can't, you know, say, oh, well, here's a new species, there's a new species. Um, sometimes instead of multiple species, you just have a variable species. Uh, like dogs are variable, or sometimes you have different genders or larvae versus adults, or that the fossilization has distorted one of the specimens. Second thing you have to be careful of when interpreting fossils is potential bias, um, because Fossils uh, do not preserve all parts of an animal with equal likelihood, nor do they preserve all organisms equally likely. So for example, we do know that some dinosaurs had feathers, all right, and certainly, you know, feathers, proto-feathers, whatever you'd like to refer to them as. Um, but we don't know how extensive these might have been um, because Many animals might have had feathers, but the fossil only preserves the bones. The bones were hard, the feathers were uh, soft. And so therefore, if you're trying to study an animal, you just have to understand that fossilization is biased. There might have been something on the skin that we don't have record of, right? So there might have been hair-like tufts. I mean, lots of animals do. I mean, some spiders look hairy, some caterpillars look hairy. Um, so a number of things might have then developed some sort of a bristle covering. Um, but how many, we don't know, because maybe that wasn't as easy, uh, as easily preserved. Uh, we know that some animals today have a trunk. So elephants have trunks, tapirs have like an a, a extendable kind of a proboscis. Um, how common was that? Well, that's going to be tough because we could have their bones, but that wouldn't necessarily preserve the soft uh, tissue. And, and so that's a, a problem. Not only is it a problem on a single organism that the hard parts would be preserved, but also on different organisms. So here we have trilobites and they have a hard outer covering. So that would be likely to be preserved. If it was buried, it would last a while. And that would give, you know, allow time for some of the processes of fossilization uh, to um, occur. Um, but then consider a different type of living thing like a jellyfish. Jellyfish, because they don't have those hard parts, would decompose much more quickly, all right, you know, or this, you know, primitive chordate. Without the hard parts, it would um, uh, deteriorate more quickly and be less likely to fossilize. And so, therefore, when you find a fossil bed, all right, oh, we have fossils of a lot of places, you might say, you know, hey, trilobites were very common, but the, we don't have any chordates. Apparently they weren't alive yet or they weren't here. You can't assume that because the trilobites are more likely to fossilize. Your fossil record is biased. Some animals are more likely to be preserved, others are not. You can't assume that jellyfish weren't there. They might have been there, but just not, you know, um, likely to be fossilized given their soft body. In the same way, you might say, oh, let's talk about the diversity of life a lot. Wow, there's a lot of these kinds of you know, fish, you know, not so many of this other kind of fish. But you might then once again be biased because certain habitats are likely to preser be preserved. If you live near a coast, it's likely that you know, a storm might bury an animal in sand or it might wash up on shore and be buried. But if you live in the open ocean, well, now it's, very, it's not very likely uh, that you would be preserved. If you live in a swamp, you could die and then fall in the muck and be buried and then be likely to be preserved. However, um, <clears throat> uh, if uh, uh, you lived in an arid area, you know, you would be unlikely to be buried. And then so, you know, scavengers would be likely to, to find you. So in this example, so these that might have been swimming in more open waters might be less likely to be preserved than uh, something that lived near uh, the coast. So when we interpret fossils, just we have to understand the records that we have, they're biased. So they preserve hard parts of the body um, more easily than soft parts of the body. Um, certain animals with hard parts are then likely to be represented in the fossil record, but there might have been soft bodied animals, you know, there at the same time, but not preserved. Just because we haven't found them doesn't mean that they weren't there. Certain habitats are more likely to be preserved 
uh, than uh, others. And so uh, there are you know, these varying degrees of uh, bias in uh, the fossil record as well. Now, um, <clears throat> one of the uh, topics I would just like to, to mention and perhaps you know, get to later is that when studying fossils and rocks and minerals, um, this appeals to biologists who are going to focus now on the, the living things and their features and the vertebrae and their place in the evolutionary trees. But obviously this also appeals to geologists who are studying the rocks, the minerals, the continents, the mountains, et cetera. Um, the course that I teach is uh, from the biology department, so that's its primary focus. But I just wanted to, to say that there are so many interesting aspects um, <clears throat> to this. So when you find rocks, it's not just fossils necessarily that you're looking for. So for example, in a big part of uh, the Mesozoic era, much of the Western United States was covered by a shallow seaway, right? And there were many areas that are to land today um, which were once covered with water. How would you know? Well, because as these seas, which covered you know, large parts of the continent, as they retreated and evaporated, the salt that was uh, there then got laid down in minerals. And so therefore you could find deposits of what are called evaporites, things like gypsum, which then um, show evidence of this was once you know, underwater, all right, and the water then retreated, and that this is then what uh, evaporated uh, from, uh, uh, from that. All right, and so once again, not uh, a fossil uh, per se, um, uh, but um, and nevertheless, you know, these rocks are helping us understand uh, about life. So, for example, in the Morrison Formation, uh, which is in the Western United States, where many great fossils are formed, are found, including many of the sauropod fossils. This is Dinosaur National uh, a Park. There, um, it uh, was um, a, an area where water. Uh, evaporated because we have evaporite. So it tells us the area was arid. Uh, and so, you know, if we were trying to understand the habitat of the animals uh, who lived there, you know, these rocks uh, then tell us stuff. Um, microorganisms, they leave their traces on the rock. So for example, um, there are uh, mounds of uh, bacteria, um, largely photosynthetic, uh, uh, which can then um, be formed like you have a film of bacteria, all right, uh, which then uh, lays down um, some uh, hard uh, material. So let's say it's in the ocean, it, you know, it becomes hard so that it can resist ocean waves, but then another layer of bacteria grows on top of that, another layer that grows on top of that. This can then be preserved as what's called a stromatolite. And you can say find stromatolites and you can say, oh, here were bacteria, including you know, very often blue-green uh, algae, uh, which were doing the photosynthesis, um, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, so that's uh, this uh, form of rock. And because they occur in shallow coastlines, you can say, oh, you know, I, I now know what kind of rock um, uh, this uh, was. Uh, so uh, there are different types of limestone, all right? And limestone, such as, uh, is composed of calcium carbonate. Um, like uh, coral reefs today. So living things can make hard aspects of themselves um, made out of calcium uh, carbonate. So corals do, mollusks do, and then uh, this calcium uh, carbonate uh, can then form uh, limestone, and there's uh, different types of limestone. So for example, some types of limestone have lots of visible mollusk shells. It's called, uh, say, coquina. Uh, and mollusks would include things like clams and snails, um, but also armored squid, uh, the uh, ammonites. Um, and so here you can see, you know, limestone, which is clearly made uh, from uh, living things. Um, but then there's lots of living things which can contribute um, uh, calcium carbonate. Now, uh, some would then be minor components of the limestone, or there could be limestones formed at different times. So in the Paleozoic, there were more crinoids, and so crinoidal limestone made uh, from um, 
crinoid. So here's part of a crinoid in uh, this limestone. So here you have rock coming uh, from uh, crinoids, um, but uh, calcium carbonate is also made by microorganisms like foraminiferans um, and others, uh, which, uh, you know, there are some arthropods, the ostracodes, which, you know, surround themselves in like a little, you know, casing of uh, calcium uh, uh, carbonate, um, which could contribute to uh, limestone. Corals can form limestone. And so um, when you get to limestone, and limestone is an abundant form of rock uh, on, uh, on earth uh, that can then be uh, uh, then transformed into marble. A lot of, you know, this is the remains of living things. Most uh, limestone and marble uh, is the remains of living uh, things. Uh, and that coral, for example, had a, um, a cup of calcium carbonate that it made around itself. Um, so there are different types of calcium carbonate. There's both calcite and aragonite, and you can see that different types of organisms make um, a different uh, types of calcium carbonate, which then is reflected in the limestone. Uh, but, you know, you learn a great deal about an area from limestone. If you have limestone, this was, you know, once organisms which made the limestone. And if it's corals or crinoids, then this was, you know, the remains of a reef. And very often the limestone will preserve, you know, components of, you know, the animals which, um, uh, which made uh, that uh, reef. Um, just a couple of other uh, examples. For a long time, there's not much oxygen in uh, the Earth's atmosphere, hardly any at all. But then once blue-green algae start performing photosynthesis, there is. And so uh, there is no oxygen in the air, and then there is oxygen in uh, the air. Um, thanks to the, the photosynthesis of these blue-green algae. And when there is oxygen in uh, the air, so there's no oxygen in the air, and then once there's blue-green algae, there is oxygen in the air. And you can tell because iron rusts. Iron rusts when there's oxygen in the air, and it didn't previously. And you have in the middle of the Precambrian -Pre these great banded iron formations where all of a sudden the oxygen which was present caused all of this iron which had been dissolved in seawater to uh, precipitate out. So once again, here's a rock that tells you about you know, life on Earth that photosynthesis had been adding, um, uh, had been adding iron to the water. Just as calcium carbonate from things like mollusks, mollusk shells and, um, and corals can form limestone, silica from say sponges or from radiolarians or from um, uh, diatoms can form chert, all right? Uh, and so um, uh, we uh, can find that, uh, you know, organisms such as this, which are surrounding themselves with silica, uh, if they were then fossilized, uh, then we could have um, a, a mineral known as chert, which would tell us about life on Earth. Um, in the Cretaceous period, there was a type of microorganism, which is still alive today, but nowhere near as abundant, apparently, called coccolithophores. Um, and coccolithophores um, then uh, laid down chalk. And actually, Cretaceous means, it comes from the Latin word for chalk. So, um, in addition to fossils telling us about, oh, here's a skeleton of a dinosaur, for example. Um, by studying the rocks, you're learning about what organisms were present because, you know, they're laying down um, limestone, they're laying down chert, you know, there's uh, oxygen in uh, the water. There was obviously a seabed here given the uh, evaporite, uh, etc. When we deal with ice ages, um, obviously uh, there was ice ages, then interglacial uh, uh, periods where the sea level kept going up and down and up and down. And we know this because of the corals and the limestone, all right, because corals need shallow water. And as sea levels kept changing, all right, then, you know, uh, when sea level was higher during an interglacial, then the corals were higher, all right. When the sea level dropped during the glacial uh, uh, epoch, uh, then uh, the corals occurred uh, deeper than they do in modern periods. So once again, uh, I'm going to primarily focus on the, the living things, you know, being a biologist and this you know, being a biology course offered by a bi biology department. Um, but obviously so much of the information is gathered by all of the work that the geologists do. And it's fascinating to study these rocks. Later in 
you know, in, in later topics, you know, we'll look at, you know, the mountain ranges are forming. So the Appalachian Mountains form here in the Paleozoic, but the Rocky Mountains are forming much later in the Mesozoic. That's important. You know, the, the continents were uh, fused to make a supercontinent. This is when they started to divide. So if you're going to study, you know, tell the story of life, then obviously the geological backdrop is very important. And I just wanted to give some of you know, those you know, hints out there just in case, you know, sometimes people are, are interested and say, hey, that's something I'd like to know more. And that may even be a field you know, that I would like to pursue. So this has been uh, just an overview of how fossils are formed. And then you know, some of the other geological aspects which can give us information uh, about uh, the past.